now a call for an approval of the agenda as presented. I make a motion to approve the agenda as it's shown here. I'll second the motion. I have a motion by Kristen Berry, supported by Wilson, to approve the agenda as presented. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Approved, same sign. Motion passed. Are there any items that you would like to remove from the consent agenda or the consent calendar? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. I'll make that motion. A motion by Grantner. Do I hear a support? I'll support. I have a support by Werner. Roll call. Commissioner Grantner? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Kishnick? Yes. Commissioner Werner? Yes. Commissioner Christianberry? Yes. Public matters and comment. Is there any public comment? Yes, Sandy. Okay, um, this is in regards to the youth program. We're off to a good start. I did talk to Mr. Borner, and we do have uh, a bank account open, and we do have $203 in the bank at this time. And I have put in for a grant from the Child Protective Service for $500. We do have our, all our sponsors now for the program and the scouts. And the Sonic Lodge is one of our sponsors. They're going to be doing a dinner soon. Um, and we're working on having a bake sale at uh, Family Fair coming up soon. But what I would like to request, and I talked to Mr. Like I said, Mr. Borner last night. We would like to request uh, some money for startup. We do have kids that cannot afford the money for the sign up for the scouts. Our scouts and the uh, youth group. So far we have 27 kids signed up. We have the uh, Teens Make a Difference group. They haven't signed up yet, but they are going to. There's 10 in there. And we do have uh, five kids in the handicap program. They have not signed up yet. Plus I've received about a dozen calls at home for different people asking when things are going to start. And we'll probably have another sign up yet. So uh, things are going good. So. Uh, I, I don't have an amount. I did talk to Bob, and he said he would talk to the board about it. It's my understanding that the scouting program is a $25 fee? Yes. Okay. As it is now, each month it comes down $2. Now, if somebody was to sign up right now, it would be $23. March 1st, it would be $21. Each month okay. it goes down $2. And then each group was like a $40 charge? Those are all paid for. Those are paid for. Those are paid for. <clears throat> Any comment? Well, that's what we were talking discussing last night about if the board we could give some money to the youth board just to get it started, which was not going to be a lot of money. Maybe, I don't know. You were asking like a thousand or a th yeah, a thousand or two thousand just to get the youth. No, a thousand would be more than enough. We have things to start up to keep adding to it, so this would be a one-time one uh, funding deal. request. Has Randy prepared the budget that we? I on? I have not been able to reach him the last couple of days. I don't know. Did you have something in mind, Mr. Byrne? Well, it was just, we discussed it, and uh, I was going to want to present it to the board that if we could at least contribute through the budget to the youth board for like $1,000, just to get them started, and, and some of the people that can't afford it right yet, but it'd be a one-time deal, and that'd be it, and then they could pay themselves later on next year or whatever, or prior to this. But if we could assist the youth board with the money out of our budget, a one-time deal. They would have, you have to submit some kind of right. invoice right. and what it's right. going to be used right. for because of uh, the type of board that this and that's is. That's what we did with Randy and stuff, trying to set this up. Okay. <laughs> I know that Mile Mason's is going to pay the $60 for the, the uh, 
Did you talk to anybody from the Masons yet, Sam? Yes, Mike Smith. They, okay. they, they have, they they've already, they are going to be the third sponsor, and they are going to pay the $40. And like I said, they're fundraising. I'm not sure when they're going to have it. He said maybe within a few weeks. Um, what they're going to do is pay for the scouting end first, for the kids' books and things like that, and anything left they would put back into the bank for the youth program because they are the targeting uh, for the Boy Scouts. And the Knights of Columbus are for the Cub Scouts. And then our youth program, along with the Teens Make a Difference, are the sponsoring organization for the Venture and Crew. Okay. All right, then the meeting on the 25th is when we will be able to act on this. That is Okay, thank you, Sandy. Okay, thank Any you, other Sandy. public comments? I'm going to go ahead. Fine, take a minute. Um, I have an urgent matter that really needs to be discussed and it greatly affects our community and it has to do with the decisions that have been made uh, between the ISP of choice for the county and it's honestly it's going to take more than two minutes of my time to try to do this and it's not something I feel that I can wait another two weeks to take in and try to discuss this so I don't know if you've got time on your agenda to take in discuss this or not with me but I feel it's pretty important to go over, and uh, so I just want to know, you know, if I get started on this, it's going to take more than two minutes of my time. Okay, this part of the agenda is not where we would take care of that. We would take care of it at the end, and if you care to wait until we get down to the public comment at the end of the meeting, okay. we'll see where we're at. Okay, I appreciate okay, that. Right. I'll wait. Right. Yes, Dave? Yeah, my questions are on the... Uh, the Boy Scout fees that are associated with that program, where does that money end up? And I can remember back when I was a Boy Scout, we were expected to earn our own money to buy our own handbook. And that entailed raking leaves, selling the snow, whatever odd jobs we could do. It put some of the, uh, the ownership back onto the individuals that are but well, Dave, at this point, it, it's a matter of these kids aren't even organized, so to speak, at this point. What we're doing is giving them some seed money in order for them to get organized so that they, in effect, for next year, could be doing exactly what they're saying. Uh, to my knowledge, the Cub Scout packs and the Boy Scout troops are really not even formed at this point. Is that correct? Yes, there are. There are two two uh, Cub Scout dens and one uh, Boy Scout uh, trooper den. I'm not sure what you would call them. They have already started. As of when? Uh, after what the last meeting we had, they had, they were working on one of right. the badges already. Right. So we're talking just a couple of weeks. Yeah, so just a couple of weeks. Yeah. So. That, that's what we're talking about, Dave, is these, these young people will be doing as you suggested. However, they really haven't had an opportunity yet to do anything. I guess my question is, where does the money end up? Does it go to the Boy Scouts of America, or, or what, what's the... That's a good question. Where, does good the, question. where will the... If, if the county grants $1,000 to the, to the Boy Scout... No, we're not, we're not doing Over. that to the Boy Scouts. Okay. We are giving it to the county program. Okay, okay. the county program. program. Shouldn't any, uh, any of the, if, if you're looking for enlistment costs for uh, startups for any youth that could not afford it at the time to get involved at that, shouldn't it just be uh, doled out as needed? And then maybe the reserve portion put back into the county coffers. As the money will stay in the county coffers and as the youth board needs it, they will draw on that. What we need to do is appropriate that money for them. 
and make it available for them to draw on. I understand there's a want to do that, but I'm not quite 100% sure there's a need. A need by who? The owner. Yeah. Well, I need by the county <coughs> or by the county commission to do it. That's where my question is, 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 is it really necessary for that to happen? For this to for this to function. Fanny, could you maybe enlighten us a little bit on that? Um well, like you said, this is all new to me. I've, I've never been in the money end of it, okay? And I'm learning like you are. Um, we do have several of the kids, not all of them, that have stated they cannot afford to, okay? Um, I do know that the uh, Boy Scouts are looking into, apparently there is a fund of six or $700 from the past Boy Scout troop they have that they're trying to get, so that would help the kids there, you know, with their books and, and start up for uniforms and things like that. Um, but we have had a lot of people that came to that say that they could not afford it, and we said we would see what we could do to help them. This is not, uh, this money, like I said, it may not be $1,000. We're not asking, you know, up front, okay? This is why we're trying to have these fundraisers to put more money in to help, you know. Um, like uh, Mr. Kirschnick said, it's not here yet. You know, it's not, I, I want a thousand, give it to me. We're trying to do some things to, to help promote this and help the kids. And they would help by helping with the bake sale and, and things like that. How much does the uh, Boy Scout manual cost? I have no idea. I, I haven't been in Scouts in 25 years, so I don't and know. And then my next question is going to be is how many, how many people would that affect? So, um, I can see maybe pulling a number out of the air, 40 or $50 for a Boy Scout man I don't know. Like I said, this program is just starting up. It's going to take time to get it going. It, it took nine months to even get it uh, started, to get it okay through the county, and so now we're working at it. It, it takes time to Boy Scouts. Like they told me, you sign more papers than you do when you go into the Army. Well, also, this will support the PIP program and other programs right, that are right. involved with this. We're not just talking about Boy Scouts and right. Cub Scouts. We're talking about all of the programs that this youth group will be supporting. And I believe there's at least three other groups formed that we have, have nothing ten, to do with... We have ten clubs at this time, plus the Boy Scouts. Plus the Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. Right. Okay. So that's, that's where we're coming from, Dave. This is money that can be appropriated to these young people to support these other programs as well as the Boy Scouts and, and Cub Scouts. I, I just don't know. Uh, the accounting seems a little bit fuzzy to me. I, I'll, I'll study it. and We will give you a full accounting. I mean, we're not, we're not out to hide anything, but what we are doing is trying to supplement the programs that were formerly done by the MSUE. And in case you don't know, it, uh, it did cost the county when 4-H was here $31,000 a year. Is what the county paid out to the 4-H program. Okay, you had a question? Well, I didn't have a question, but, uh, well, first of all, I'm my name's Ron, not for you that don't know me. I'm also the commander of the VFW post. Now, I just passed her some information. VFW would be gladly, uh, and we have programs set up to help specifically the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, right down the line. I know that the American Legions also have programs. This is the first that I've heard of this, so, you know, or if I'd have known about it uh, this past Monday, I could have brought it on the floor and she'd have had a check rate already. Uh, so there's different organizations in this town that are actually set up to help the Boy Scouts. If you would just get some information out there, they would more than gladly help, you know, and it would cut down on what the county would have to uh, provide. We appreciate that. You know, very I mean, much. Uh, if we, you know, let's say just between the three, the, the, the three military organizations, 
Uh, even if each one of them gives three hundred dollars, you know that's three hundred dollars less that this county has to provide. Although I believe there'd be probably more than that, but you know. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, just give us a chance, you know, and we'll, well we've been help. discussing this since last August. Well, and, uh, that that could be so, but you know, I mean, I just started coming. I do. I finally been able to have time to come to these meetings, and for the past four or five t month our meetings, I've been coming. So I haven't heard about it, you know, and even as through the VFW, uh, going to different functions and stuff, I have heard absolutely nothing. Nothing's even come to our floor, you know, as far as our members or anybody. So this is the very well, first guess, we've this known. This is a situation where Sandy didn't know you. I understand, and this is what I'm saying, is if you get the little more information out there, the people that don't know would gladly step forward and help. I have a question. How do we get the, it, the article was in the paper with Sandy. A couple times, I believe, and I don't know how else we can get the art, the information out there. Rather than yeah. you know, if, if I understand that, I understand that. Well, I'd like to know from you how can we get information out to the people better than what the news. Hey, I'm are. not. Hey, I've got the same problem you have. All right. So, you know, that's what I understand. I I do understand that. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, is because of my per personal situation, I haven't been able to. You work mm -hmm. 16 hours a day and put put two or three three and a quarter hour driving time on top of that you don't have much time to do anything else and you're talking well, seven days that. a week now I'm done with it I'm retired so I'm coming to these meetings I want to learn find out what's going on in the community uh, no and I appreciate you know, that but I'm so I don't know because usually Sandy gives us an update at least every other meeting don't you Sandy yeah right and unfortunately unfortunately as far as my VFW post. I'm the only member that comes to these meetings. So I know your membership is getting well it, out pretty much. It, it, actually, it's actually starting to grow. Really? But unfortunately, well, uh, the people either don't have the time or they're not taking the interest in coming to these meetings, which is a shame. More people should get interested uh, because the more interested the people are here, it's more people that can help you make this community grow. But Neither, neither said it or not, you know. Uh, I've got the information. I'm willing to take it back and do something with it. And if she'd contact, just pick the phone up and call and talk to uh, the two, vi or two, two American legions, I would imagine they would more than gladly help. That's all I'm saying. And Mr. Knott, give me yeah. his phone number. Right. You know. okay. if, if you would take a minute and talk to Sandy. Yes, I will. Meeting. After the meeting, I intend I to. I appreciate that very yeah. much. And uh, Dave, out. that may we solve the problem. Okay. Uh, when we ran for election, one of the things that all five of us said, we need more communication within this county. This is part of the problem. We're looking for a solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. This helps us and it helps you and it helps the community. That's right. And I do appreciate your stepping forward. And uh, I have to say I appreciate what Sandy's doing for our youth. And if we can get things coordinated here, that's what we're all about. If we can save the taxpayers some money, absolutely. That's what we're here about. So I appreciate your stepping forward and making the offer. Thank you. You know, it's a shame. You know, that you can put all the articles you want in paper, and until you talk one on one to a person, it doesn't get through. You're absolutely you know. right. Okay, we'll move right along here. Any other public comment? Okay. Now I am confused. <coughs> Cassie is here. Are you prepared? I am, but I would request that I be shifted to the you last scheduled appointment. third on the list. Well, that was easy. Thank you. So I have to be in court in five minutes, so I don't think I'm going to have time to present, but I'll come back after I'm done with my hearing. I thought you told me you had a meeting at 10.30. I have a meeting with the judge in court at 10.30. <laughs> and you said it would take about 10 minutes. Yep. And so I'll come back after I'm done with that, and I can go last on the agenda. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Moving right along, we'll go with Mr. Gordon Stryker. I got moved right up to the top of the agenda. <laughs> it's not 10 o'clock. There you go. Um, my name is Gordon Stryker. I'm with um, MGT of America. And um, I have um, 
presented to the board um, through Brenda um, a proposal to do your cost allocation plan. I've been before the um, board quite a few times, I think two or three times now, um, on different matters. Uh, MGT of America is a, a company that does work with um, governmental entities like yourself. Um, I think that included in the packet um, was there, and hopefully, was there a map um, included yes. in the yes. packet? Um, the map shows you um, our client base that we have in Michigan. Um, we are a national company. Um, we're all over the country. Um, but we have, in the last four years, um, opened an office in Michigan um, and have been um, very aggressive in um, working with the counties in Michigan. Um, and we uh, started working with Mike, who's the friend of the court, shared circuit. Um, we worked with Mike um, and, um, and recently um, started working with uh, your prosecutor's office doing what we call the Title IV-D billing service. Title IV-D is the federal program, which is the child support program. IV-D is the Social Security Act, Title IV-D. Um, and so we've been working with the prosecutor's office and the friend of the court office. One of the components of that is that it allows the county to get reimbursed for the expenditures. Uh, the direct expenditures from that office get sent to the state, and the state, through the federal government program, reimburses the county 66% of every dollar that you spend for that program, the direct expenditures. One of the things that the federal government will allow you to do also is get reimbursed for the indirect expenses of operating those programs. The indirect expenses would be um, the processing of the payroll. Um, um, that would be the clerk's time, the processing of invoices, um, processing of accounts receivables, accounts payable, um, providing a building, the heat, thank goodness there's heat, <laughs> um, electricity, the insurance, um, if there's um, IT costs, things like that. Those are what we call indirect costs. And if you can identify the indirect costs, the federal government will allow you to get reimbursed 66% for those costs also. So what we do is we um, will prepare for you a cost allocation plan, which says these are all of your indirect costs. We pool them all together, and then we split them up, and we identify the indirect costs for each one of the departments. There's only two, really two departments in your um, county that get impacted through the cost allocation plan, which is the front of the court's office and the prosecutor's office. But the federal government requires us to allocate to all the departments to show that um, the allocation is um, fair and equitable um, to all the departments, not just, I mean, it would be ideal to say that the cost to heat this building should all be borne by um, uh, Cassie's office. Um, and then we get reimbursed for the total cost of heating all of it. Well, that's not fair and equitable. The federal government says, well, Cassie's office has um, uh, uh, square footage and um, her percentage of the space will be allocated um, as a cost to, um, uh, to the federal government to heat that, that area. Um, but because of that, we also can identify the cost for the clerk's office and the cost for the treasurer's office to heat their space. And that portion of the time that they're spending doing work for Cassie's office and for the friend of the court's office, we can identify that cost through the cost plan too. It's kind of confusing, kind of detailed, um, but that's what we do for you. Um, I created for you a proposal um, to do the cost plan. Um, there's, as I said, uh, there's a, a continuity between the billing service and the cost plan, and it, it works to your advantage to have a um, single vendor doing both. It's not necessary, but it works to your advantage to have a single vendor doing both. Um, you currently have another vendor doing your cost allocation plan. It's been doing it for a while. Um, one of the reasons why there are so many counties that are moving over to um, MGT is that it's a new set of eyes looking at, um, looking at your cost and trying to maximize the amount of money that you're going to get reimbursed um, for the federal government. My proposal that I've got is um, a set amount. It's, uh, I, I provided a sample contract for you. Um, our, our, prod, our company has a... Uh, uh, no hassle contracting. We're going to get a con if you decide to go with us, we're going to get a contract with you very quickly. Um, whatever the terms are that you need. 
Uh, and what, what I'm proposing for you is a, what we call a contingency fee contract. That I'm going to get you money back. Um, we're going to identify the costs. We're going we're to work with the front of the court and the prosecutor's office to get those costs sent to the state so that you get reimbursed. As soon as you get reimbursed for those costs and the state starts sending money back to the county um, to recover for those costs, we're going to split that money with you. This is what the terms are, um, the, re uh, the um, contingency fee part. We're going to split those costs um, dollar for dollar. Um, so if you get a dollar um, back from the state for those costs, we're going to split it 50 cents. You're going to get 50 cents, we're going to get 50 cents <coughs> until we identify $14,000 in costs. Um, at that point, any additional costs above and beyond that that you're going to get back from the state, you're going to get um, the full dollar. Does that everyone understand that part? Up to $7,000. Up to $7,000. Yep. So, the question I have for you is, what questions do you have about cost allocation plans? I, you've got the proposal that, that the deal that outlines um, MGT. As I said, we've been around for a long time, 30 years. Um, and we've been doing cost allocation plans um, for counties just like yours um, for 30 years. Um, and we'd love to have the opportunity to work with you. You guys have any questions at all about it? You can go back to the year 2013 and you'll do that one too. Um, the way that it works, um, kind of a good question, that, that part of it gets a little confusing too, is that we will do the 2013 because it's based on actual expenditures, okay? So your, and they're actual audited expenditures. So your audit is being com, um, completed right now for 2013. They started to come in and start doing your audit, and you'll get that probably around June, maybe, um, maybe. final audit. Um, so maybe. <laughs> What we do is we take your actual audit expenditures for 2013. So we do the 2013 plan in 2014. It then gets, once the plan is completed, it gets delivered to the state of Michigan for approval. There's really not much of an approval process. We send it to the state of Michigan. Um, and then we start using that number in two, for the 2015 billings. Okay? So in 2015, <coughs> we'll take... If we identify that um, uh, there are $30,000 in indirect costs to operate the, um, the prosecutor's office, we'll take one twelfth of that each month and include it in the billings that we do for the prosecutor's office right now and send it to the state, and you'll start getting reimbursed for those in 2015. So you do it monthly instead of the one giant deal at the end of the year. The cost allocation plan is done, there's one cost allocation plan each year, and it comes up with one number for your, for your whole year of costs for 2013, okay. and then that number gets divided in 12, this is what the state requires, gets divided in 12. And then through Cassie's office and through Mike's office um, for the billings, um, the state allows you to do monthly billings. Instead of doing um, one billing for the end of the year for all the expenditures, direct and indirect costs, um, we send monthly billings so you have a constant cash flow coming through. Um, and then you get reimbursed for those monthly also. So, so in 2015, we could have a different set of numbers or a different cost allocation number for 2014? Yes. Go ahead. Yep. And that's what my, my, my proposal is... Um, um, it's a three-year, I believe it's a three-year, four-year, it's a four-year um, project. Um, basically, we're doing cost allocation plans for 13, 14, 15, and 16. That's what one of the, the requirements. The federal requirement, the state requirement, is that you have a cost allocation plan done every year if you want to continue getting reimbursed for those costs. Now, we won't have to buy any additional software for us. This is all in your... Right. Yeah, absolutely. What you're going to get from me is uh, every year <coughs> you'll get a bound cost allocation plan like this. And the cost allocation plan, this happens to be um, Alpina's, um, and then a it'll have all the details to all the expenditures. Again, um, as I said, it's kind of detailed, um, but it's 
it shows you how all the expenditures get allocated out. And then there's the summary page at the top here, at the front of, the, of it, that identifies each one of the departments and what the total cost is, indirect cost is, for each one of the departments. And then what you do is you take the number for the prosecutor's office. Prosecuting attorney's office here um, in Alpena, it was $71,000 of indirect costs. And then that gets split in 12 way, in, into 12 segments, mm -hmm. and each month, one twelfth of it gets um, it gets charged back to the state, and you get reimbursed for that. So about six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. You'll also get it electronically. Um, I mean, I, one of the things that we're finding is that um, we used to bind. Gosh, we used to cut down a lot of trees um, and bind a lot of copies. Um, and what we're finding now is that a lot of our clients want them electronically. It's easier for Brent to store electronically, um, and it's easy you know, for everybody else, instead of having a big pile of them in the um, Board of Commissioners room, um, to store them electronically. So we're going to get you an electronic copy of the cost plan also. And I saw there was training involved in there, too. Is that a lot of training for... Who would that be? Uh, well... Uh, who, who, you know, I saw... It. It said something about a, a county administrator that was trained on the design and purpose. Who would that be in this county? Well, it could be anybody. Um, and one of the things that I found is that um, historically there's been a lack of information on why you do a cost allocation plan. Um, I mean, every year the commissioners just sign the contract and, and they get the, the cost plan um, and they don't really know why they're doing it or what, what it's used for. Um, so one of the things I really enjoy doing is coming in and um, educating you um, and why you're doing it and what the benefits are. There are some additional benefits that you can use the cost allocation plan for to recover some additional costs um, for the county. Um, and I can help you work, work through that. So the training part for me is to get started on the cost plan. I like to come in and I like to talk to you either um, in a board meeting like this or in a finance committee meeting um, uh, and sit down with you. Have you have the opportunity to talk to me a little bit about your county operations um, and uh, so that we can make sure that we can maximize the amount of recoveries that we can identify for you. Um, it's a dialogue back and forth, but it allows you to ask questions also so that I can train you on what, what it is that I'm doing and why it is that I'm doing because one of the things that we need to do is figure out what your allocation statistics are going to be. Um, I'm going to get, as part of the project, a download from your, um, uh, your financial system of all of your um, expenditures, your um, transactions. Transaction counts are one of the um, allocation statistics that we use um, to allocate, you know, whether, whether it be um, uh, accounts receivable, accounts payable, uh, transaction counts are one of them number of um, employees that you have is another um, allocation statistic that gets um, used. Square feet for the building um, is another allocation statistic. Those are the kinds of things I like to sit down and talk to you about to see if there might be a better allocation statistic which would be um, more advantageous for the county to get more money back. I haven't heard anything from that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Now you said it's seven thousand dollars for each plan. We got front of the court. We got prosecutor and that's fourteen thousand, correct? No, no, that's that's what I was talking about with regards to the federal government requires that um, that you have one plan done every year, okay, and that the plan allocates to all of the departments. So you're going to in this plan here, you're going to find the the number, the indirect costs for the front of the court and for the prosecutor's office. You're also going to have the indirect costs for the clerk's office, the indirect costs for the board of commissioners, indirect costs for treasurer, all the other departments you have in the county. So it's just one plan um, each year. Yeah, because I get back in here, assess, you know, up there are 7000 each. You get back in here and service cost plan 7000 for each of the four cost allocation plans. Yeah, so you're going to do one plan each of the four years. So it's $7,000 each. So we're going with a four-year contract? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what the, your announcement said that you wanted to do. 
I just seen two years with additional one and all that. The, the two years, actually, that, that works. <laughs> the reason why I include that language in the contract is that it's two additional option years because at the end of the four-year period, um, a lot of times what we're finding with our clients is that um, oh Fred does a great job of staying on top of it, but there are some clients that um, you get to the end of the contract period and then you realize that you don't have time to go out and get bids um, for uh, the next contract period. And so what I do is I have in the contract um, two one-year options so that if you need to, for the one year is that we can get a contract in place very quickly by just saying, yeah, let's just use this contract. It's already in the contract. Let's use this as a vehicle for one more year. It helps you. I, I, think, I think it helps the counties. Going hand in hand with that, you said the $7,000 per year. Yep. What if you said it's a 50-50 up to the $14,000 <coughs> range. What if it's only like 12000 Is the fee still $7,000? If um, we were able to identify and recover $12,000 of indirect costs, the fee would be capped at 6000 for us. So our fee would be 6000 because we're splitting we're splitting the recoveries up to the $14,000. I understand that, but I don't believe that's what this said. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what it Tell me, tell me, I mean, I tried to make it. I, mean, I, I can word that any way you want, but let me say that it's difficult to word it. To, that's, a fixed, that's a fixed fee of $7,000 for each plan year. Yep. So it's four years. Four years. Okay. A fixed fee, though, that, that's what bothered me, was a right. fixed fee for it. Now, are you under the, in the contract? In the contract. Under the compensation section? Right. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I asked him about that before that. So the, the, it's the full fee, the full payment is due when the client receives the, the cost plan. Recoveries will be shared equally until the annual not to exceed fee is paid in full to MGT. If the shared amount is less than the amount needed to pay MGT's fee, no further payment will be due MGT. I'm, if you've got better wording, I'm willing to put it in. <laughs> because I hear what you're saying, and I see what I'm reading. Okay. I, I, like I, I said, I, I will get a contract as, in place. As long as we're in agreement that uh, it's a 50-50 up to the $14,000, and that's the max we're ever going to pay is $7,000. $7,000 each year um, is the maximum you're going to pay for your cost allocation plan. Really cost and it could be less. less. So it's ten thousand dollars it's five. Yep. Okay. So yeah. very good. Total? Oh. Any other questions? <coughs> Mark? Nope. The other thing that I will do for you is I will guarantee you that I will get spring here as quickly as possible. <laughs> 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 Well, your credibility is now shot. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick question. Yes. Does this replace um, the contact that we did or have previously done with Cassie and Mike if we would go this route? No. no. It doesn't. That's no. on top. That's Correct. different. This is yes. just the county. That's just the cost plan. The billing service is separate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you ultimately will have um, three agreements. Mm -hmm. with MGT. One for the billing service for the friend of the court, one for the billing service for the prosecutor, and one for the cost allocation plan. Okay. And that's what we currently have, just with another company. All I can say at this point, Gordon, is we do have another presentation to hear. Uh, quite honestly, I see some definite advantages in rolling everything into one, one person. So. Having said that, we thank you very much for your time and your presentation, and uh, you'll be hearing from us. Sounds good. And if you need to have me come back up, and if you have any more questions, um, please feel free to give me a call. Uh, my telephone number is on the top of the proposal letter that you have there. Um, and you have your card. You've got my card? Good. You've got my number. <laughs> we do. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.
I'm going to help you out or you yep. well, drop her up. I'm going to let Todd talk first. <laughs> I'm not really sure what Brenda's looking for from me because I'm not a director or I just volunteer my, my services for the county. But I can update you on uh, what we've done since the fiscal year started with the trust fund in Lansing, which would be 1 September. We pumped out uh, $5,837.75 in your county. Now give me that number again. 5000 $837.75. And that's from the trust fund? That's from the trust fund. Because the working budget that we may want to have isn't what's going to happen. We get quarterly allotments of $265 for the trust fund, for the operation. Anything that exceeds a grant <coughs> that the, our committee approves to our, our trust fund district of Roscoe and Nascota County. $2,000 more is handled by the committee. Anything in excess of $2,000 request has to go to Lansing. So we never know what it's going to be because of a winner like this. Uh, see, yesterday I did $9,000 in Roscoe County. One day. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what's going to happen until somebody comes in with emergency needs. So the budgeted amount would be the $265 a quarter. So you never really know what your budget's going to be. Um, as far as what we've done so far is um, electricity, electricity, natural gas, um, phone bills, attorney fees, taxes, taxes uh, repairs on vehicles, uh, house payments, mortgage, uh, as well as as our uh, mileage for our meetings, which is 23 bucks, and uh, another auto repair for our company. So it, uh, I try to come over every Wednesday, but if there's nobody here and there's no appointments set up, I'm driving 78 miles round trip to sit and watch the snowfall. So <laughs> if, uh, if somebody calls and they have our numbers, then I can come on over every Wednesday. <clears throat> I will be here tomorrow. Who is setting up your appointments, Tom? They call in the, the phone number that's at uh, the office, and then they're transferred over to us. When we're not come? physically, yeah. When we're not physically there. So if there's an emergency need. Now, AJ sat in for me last Wednesday when I was down at the uh, Congressional Breakfast, sponsored by the American Legion, last Wednesday. So he sat in for me and had somebody come in. So where he sits on the committee, he's up to speed on how things are supposed to be done, and he can start walking things through. I'm just a paper pusher. But I do know my experience with Ross Common, in retrospect to the cost allocation. For the trust fund, there was no cost allocation figured in for that county, for the trust fund. So here, I do know that if I send something out, the post office here for the county is sending, I guess, a bill, which I don't even know where it goes. But I know my balance that I show on my ledger is $20 less than what it shows with the county ledger. If that's postage, then I'm going to need something from the county showing I've got $20 worth of postage when I send stuff out. I'll need that from them. I have to balance my books with them. So have you been in touch with Jerry or anything? Yeah, it was there today. And I, I got to print out and I started adding everything up. And I got a $20 difference. So I'm, I'm guessing it must be the postage. Because when I do packets and mail them out, they cost $5 a piece. I guess not just entertain a question if you have any questions. Well, she sets up appointments and then you check your office. How can well, you I'm, I'm in Ross Common four days a week. Okay, but how can you, if you're con communicating on the phone, how can you miss if there's no appointments here? I mean, how do you know? You say you have to call uh, the office to find out if there's people scheduled for appointments, but then if there's nobody scheduled, why do you come over then? Why do you drive over? That's why I didn't come over two weeks ago. 
because there's nobody to call this guy to okay. It's just a long drive. And, and the, the person before me, he never came unless somebody called him at his residence. <coughs> That's why you only had $465 a year going on. So there's, uh, and this winter's been kind of rough. I look for, by the time we're done between the two counties, probably 1,000. Really? Yeah. We're pushing 30,000 for our county already, and you're, uh, you're pushing six. So, and we're just into the second quarter. We appreciate what you're doing, Tom. Uh, any questions? How's everybody doing this morning? Okay. I'll just give, kind of give you a quick overview since uh, the Veterans Office has opened up last year, April. Uh, we have seen a total of 547 veterans in the office. Um, it's going well. It's still busy. We kind of started off a little slow this year due to the fact that we moved offices and we had a little phone issue. <laughs> <laughs> Working with M33 and Frontier, our phones were out for like the first almost three weeks of January. So we had a lot of people trying to call, trying to get in. They were, you know, I they, thankfully most of them did get a hold of me over Ross Common because I left that option open because I am not here Monday through Thursday. So if they need to come and see me, they can call at Ross Common during that time of the week and schedule with either Tom or I for Friday or Wednesday. So now we finally got it handled. People are making appointments and flowing in pretty good. We're getting back busy again. Like I said, it was quiet due to the fact the phones were down and people didn't even know we were there or the location. So now we got that nailed down. So they're starting to flow back in. Schedule's starting to get busy again. So the office itself is looking good. Um, let's see. I know we hit, we did set a proposal up for a millage. I know there's going to be tons of questions. <laughs> and asked why we asked for the $130,000 and I can kind of give you a, a brief explanation as to why the amount. Is there any questions before I jump into that though about the office or anything like that? What are you averaging a week over there? As far as people in the office? Right. Anywhere from six to twenty people. I had a dozen last Friday. There was twelve people that came in the office last Friday, so it varies. Plus the weather, due to the weather, one Friday I had maybe three people come in. I had a couple walk-ins, so we still kind of having some walk-ins come in, but but on average, it's like anywhere from six to twenty. And you're strictly on a uh, appointment basis. Now. Yes. There are appointments. Yeah, they have to make an appointment. A lot of times if they do show up, most of the time when somebody does show up, I am with somebody, and they've been really nice. I said, okay, I got I got an open space at 2 o'clock. You come back then, and they usually come back that same day. I don't turn somebody away and say, well, you got to call and make an appointment for next week since, you know, <laughs> I don't do that. Uh, or if I'm open when they come in, okay, come on in. I'm not turning down people. But if I am with somebody, you know, they understand. So they'll either hang out and wait and... It's been working out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Most of the people, like I said, my walk-ins were pretty heavy there for a while, but they're starting to slow down. They're starting to actually call and make appointments first, which is good because it's given me, when you get 20 people in a day, that's one red for another. So usually I'm staying overtime at the end of the day to catch up finishing what I started with everybody in the morning throughout the day. It's hard to finish up with somebody right away when you got somebody else waiting. So in a way, the appointments have been working out great because it's given me a good 15, but I, I give at least a 10, 15 minute gap between people. That way I can finish up what I worked with this veteran and get ready for the next one. And I know what they're coming, it's nice to know what they're coming in for now too, because then I can be better prepared. If I got somebody that's coming in for an aid attendance claim, all right, we're going to need at least 45 minutes. I'll make sure all the paperwork's together, everything that I need for that veteran is ready to go when they come to that office, and maybe then the visit's only a half hour instead of 45 minutes or 20 minutes because now I'm prepared for when they come in. Instead of just having somebody come in, okay, what can I help you out with today? Well, I don't know. Let's see. What can you help me out with today? <laughs> so the appointments have been nice because I'm able to plan the day out better and get it organized and not have such a rush and backed up with people. And then I'm backed up with paperwork, and I have to go back and catch it up. 
So it's nice. I, I kind of do like the appointments. So I'm actually planning on maybe doing that with Roscom as well because the workload's been busy. So having that extra couple minutes between people is nice to have. You get that catch up. That way you're not making it up at the end of the day and having to spend till six, seven o'clock at night trying to catch up on everything. So it's been working great though. Okay. You're good. Thank you. Yep. Okay, now uh, we'll go to the millage. The reason why we asked for 130000 um, is just to kind of break down what goes into that cost would be, you know, wages, uh, cost and allocations. Granted, we might not have any big cost allocations right now, but what's to say that at the end of the year, we have to look for another office space. So we're going to have cost allocations. It, like I said, it may not be large at this moment, but... There's, an there's a chance that those costs and allocations, we would need to fund an office space. Um, postage, transportation, we do have a transportation schedule uh, that is taken off and it's doing very well. Um, emergency relief money. Um, now, once the millage goes, the county no longer has to appropriate that 30000 because it's going to be 30000 coming out of my millage. So the county no longer has to appropriate that money. But I have to make sure that I appropriate it through my village, and it has to be the thirty thousand uh, burials and markers. We still have to put. I kind of gave an estimate, like um, the emergency monies, thirty thousand would have to be put aside. Burials and markers, anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars would have to be budgeted. Uh, transportation, about fifteen thousand. Now that could change because we are in the process of still working on getting a vehicle, but. We still have to maintain the maintenance gas, and then what happens is monthly we get reimbursed from VA for any expenses we use for that vehicle that they are giving to us to use for transportation. So I still have to put I still have to put monies aside for transportation. Right there, just them three alone is about sixty thousand to be put aside for operating and maintaining those. The burials, anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand. Uh, burials aren't well. I had eighteen hundred in burials for the month of January, so it just depends. I mean, I have had two months in a row that I didn't have any. Uh, this county, like I said, because well, now that I kind of gave the funeral director a little like, more explanation on burials, he's understanding it better. So I'm probably going to see a lot more because there was I didn't have any burials for November, December. I have only had. Two, I think, since I opened the office. But now he's got a better understanding of how the burials work and the law and who gets granted, who's not. We're probably going to be seeing a lot more. Maybe not as large, but that's why I said anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand to be budgeted for burials is is a good window. Do they um, pay the full price of those burials? We pay a three hundred dollar. The county pays a three hundred dollar burial for veterans and surviving spouses of veterans. He thought it was just for veterans, but no, it's 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 for surviving spouses as well. So that's why we, you know, budget that much. But like I said, um, and plus the future of the office down the road, one person right now part time is good, but two would be better only because, for an example, I wasn't in the office. If that door is closed, I can guarantee you're going to have a lot of angry people. <laughs> Even though, if I know I'm not going to be on a Friday, I make sure that I don't have appointments, but you still do have walk-ins. still have walk-ins. may only be one or two people, but you still have walk-ins. And it might be that one person that kind of angry because we're supposed to be here on Friday, but we're not. So having kind of two people in the office is a bonus. We're starting to do that as well in Roscommon because we're realizing that, you know, we can't close the office. It's just not possible. We have a lot, we have a workload that comes in and we need somebody there. So down the road for future, having two people in the office, whether they just be two part-timers or they have a full-time and a part-time, either way it works, you have to budget for those wages and, and whatnot. Um, and all the other little fees that go, like I said, postage and office supplies. and uh, when On the worded for the millage, when it said equipment, equipment meaning just down the road, we have a computer, so we don't have to worry about that, but what if down the road we end up having to pick an office building and we need a brand new printer? That's the equipment desks. I mean, granted, we get desks from the county, but just kind of as an example. That's what the equipment means in the verbiage for the millage. 
And the first verbiage that I had out that I gave to Brenda, that was a state draft from the state, from the VA. Because you have to maintain that word in there that states that it's also going to be put aside for monetary emergency relief. Let's see if we mention it right off. Uh, to provide monetary support and assistance services to veterans through the County of Oswego Veterans Affairs Department. Right there, that's meaning that those funds, you, you, the county won't have to appropriate that 30000 because we will have that appropriated to our millage. Elizabeth, can I interject for one second? Sure. On uh, getting back to where she was talking about the possibility of two people, when she's there on Fridays, she, she's sitting there taking care of a person. She's trying to answer the phone. She's trying to take care of the door, and it's almost impossible for her to, to do justice to the person because of the fact the phone calls, the door, all the inter other interruptions that are going on. I know that I've been trying to stay up there with her, just to, besides trying to learn what's going on, but being able to help her because people, we've had a few people come in that uh, have problems, and they get highly upset if, if the system isn't running smoothly. You know, there's a stoppage here, a stoppage here, you know, so uh, it, it's quite important really to start looking at, hey, you know, whether it be volunteer or whether it be paid to get the second person in there for her. Friday was quite chaotic. Right. <laughs> the committee got to see how a day runs in the office. Like I said, even though I scheduled the appointments, it seemed like that was a good day for Watkins that Friday yeah. and we had our we had our veterans meeting and yeah the phone the phone is a big thing when you're with somebody that phone can ring I'm not kidding you I could sit with somebody with 10 minutes and probably have six phone calls mm -hmm. <laughs> sitting with a veteran for 10 minutes and I, I try not to you know I do answer them because again a lot of people are like well just let the answer machine get it but you don't want anybody mad either because right. you got veterans out there that are short tempered that feel that and plus, trying to get back to phone calls, sometimes it's at the end of the day I'm finally getting calls back out to people that did or had to leave a message. So some days the office can be... So the primary purpose of your village is to add additional people to the office. Well, it's to be able to fund... I mean, when I'm looking at a $60,000 amount here, we're looking at, uh, you said, most of that's wages. Not the, not the 60000 no. 60000 wages, cost allocation, and transportation. 60000 right. was just for transportation, emergency monies, and burials. Mm -hmm. That's what the 60000 alone. $60,000 can be budgeted just alone for those three. I That's not including it, wages. Partly wages. No. It's not. Okay. Nope. <coughs> like I said, transportation, you at least got to put 15000 aside for the transportation. Emergency monies, like I said, because now we have to appropriate that thirty thousand. That thirty thousand is going to be taken out for for veterans relief, and then the burials and markers is anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand. So that those three just alone is about sixty thousand, and that's without wages, cost allocations, and stuff like that. So if we budget for wages, let's say just kind of throw a figure out there. If you have two part timers, that's probably around roughly about twenty thousand. Then cost and allocations. My cost and allocations in Ross Common is nine thousand dollars, and that's having an office in the county building. So if there's not an opportunity, and if I have to find an office space, debating on how much that's going to cost me a year, but I got to think about all the maintenance go that goes with an office space: plowing, making sure maintenance is done on the building, the rent, the electricity, the uh, Internet, phones, all those are included. So that's probably another about ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year, give or take. You so really got into your training. Yeah. Get oh. somebody to take your place. We don't know what Ross County is going to do with you next year. Right. That's right. We you got to have some money aside for training. I mean, granted, I might not be here next year, but you still have to put aside because I have to maintain my accreditation every year. I have to have a certain amount of hours every year in training, so I have two conferences that I attend every year. So you have to appropriate, you have to put budget money aside for training purposes. And then if you're going to get somebody new, if like I said, if they don't decide to renew my contract, 
you got to have an accredited service officer to do claim work. So that, depending on where the accreditation is, the cost is going to vary. You know, they, they wanted to get me accredited right away. I went to Reno. So it cost them just about $4,000 to send me accreditation. This year it's in Michigan. So it might only be $1,200 for accreditation. Because there's a $300 registration fee for all accreditation classes. And then that's including your night stays, your transportation, if you have to fly or if you're driving, whatnot, meals. So you have to set a certain amount aside as well for training. If you already get an accredited service officer in that place, then okay, you just got to make sure you still put training costs aside. Because again, I have to maintain my accreditation every year. Thankfully, the association that I belong with, the Michigan Veterans Association of County Counselors, we do a conference twice a year, so that way we can maintain our accreditations. And it's in the state of Michigan, so we don't have to go anywhere else. But if you had someone that wanted to maintain their own training hours, they can go anywhere they want for training hours. If the county approves, as long as they maintain their training hours. They can go to Indianapolis, they can go to Washington. There's a couple other areas if they don't want to be a part of the Michigan Association of County Veterans Counselors. That's why I love being a part of that association, because... They help us maintain our accreditation, but we still have to pay for training. Not as much as we would because a lot of times the state will take care of our training fees. Um, when I do my conferences, the only thing I have to take care of is my meals and my mileage because the state covers for, oh, and my registration for the class, which is usually about 55 bucks. The state covers our, our board. They cover our rooms because of the association that we belong with. So it's not as much if you already have an accredited counselor, but you still have to put funds aside for training. So there, there, there's a bunch of, I mean, I, I could list line items, basically what what needs to... But you're basing these on what's happening in Roscommon County, no. right? No. Well, how no. can you base a whole week on one day a week? You mean work? No, I mean, how can you base these figures? For your, you know, the hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and I heard what you were saying, and don't get me wrong, because this is going to be up to the voters anyhow. Mm -hmm. But didn't we have? Wasn't it just thirty thousand we were paying to soldiers and sailors one before hour. we had one day a month? And one I day a month, that, right? one hour, this is, this one hour. The, can I speak? I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, I... This was this was what we had for years, and then we brought in Elizabeth, and we partnered with Roscommon County, and then it cost us 59000 if I'm correct, and almost double. Is that true, Brenda? Um, the budget is twenty nine for the Veterans Department, and 30, we've got still 30000 For soldiers, for sailors, soldiers. and relief. And, and now it's going to double again, and we haven't even had this program running for a year. A year. A year. Yeah, before, yeah. I, you know, and I don't get me wrong, I, I, I do agree, you do good things, it's just, I, you know, I would like to see your millage pass, but I think it's kind of high. Mm -hmm. And it's not me, and it's not this board that's saying oh, no, to that's do completely this, it, it's, it's the voters, and right. I'm just wondering, you know, you hate to get shot down. That's right, and when, before when you guys had just the soldiers and sailors, again, that 30000 was just for the relief. So, and of course, they're coming for one hour a day. But now you're giving more services. Instead of just emergency relief, you're providing more services for the veterans. So it's, and plus, like I said, it, one day a week, it may not be up to full-time standards, but at least another day a week, one or two more days a week for this office well, would benefit. Well, I understand that too, and I understand the, about the answer in the phone. But, you know, people do have to understand. You aren't the Secretary of State where you walk in and stand in a line. I mean... Oh, they like the big guy. Because <laughs> yeah, they well, do I come in and be in line. But life's tough all over, you know. Right. I mean, you can't walk in, you could walk into Cassandra's office and sit down for three hours because she's, she's got a job to do. Right. Uh, I'm sure there's other ones that we couldn't walk into the office. you got to make an appointment, and that's just life, right. you know. And I would hope... That on the phone message, you tell them that you can call Roscommon yes. to make appointments and things like that. Yep. But again, like I said, it just it just seems a little high to me. But if that's what you know, that's what you guys are shooting for. Okay. And those are my reasons. 
you know, it just seems like... How many veterans do we have in the county of Oshkosh? The GDX, the new GDX hasn't came out yet, but the last recording was for 2012, and roughly just under 1,500 veterans were in the county. But now that, again, the GDX... So we're talking less than 25 per week to come into the office if they all come in. Mm -hmm. No. Pretty much. And what percentage of the veterans that live in Oscoda County are actually registered? Do you have any? That I don't know, and I can tell you there are quite a few. I've had quite a few that never recognized or went out. Like when they go do paperwork, they don't like to recognize themselves as a veteran. I have a lot of Vietnam vets that just refuse to. They had a bar bad time. So there is still a lot of unrecorded veterans in the county. So like I said, that's just an estimate. That's of what the state of Michigan, based on certain information where they get their figures from, has come up around this county, what the estimated, what they have on their numbers, what is in Oscoda County. It could be more, could be less. Well, I, I'm going along with what Mark said, and, and that is when I break it down, I'm looking at the most you could have is 25 veterans coming in a week. Mm -hmm. So that would be five per day. If you're on a five-day week. you got to remember that there are people that come in on a rotating basis. Like, it's not just new veterans every right. week. We might have a veteran, like I said, if we're doing a big comp claim for, he might be in my office every Friday for the next three weeks. Okay. So, you know, you got people or people coming in that we did the claim, got denied, we have to do the appeal. So, I mean, the services are there for the veterans for whatever they need with their client. It's not just to start a new claim or just to apply for benefits. There's so many other avenues. That's why people keep using our office as a reference. So they they're, going, go they're going back to the percentage of 20 percent of the veterans are getting 80 percent of the service. Right. Like one week it might be high. Next week it could be down. Right. You don't yep. know what's happening. That's the problem we have. We don't know what they're coming in. Every week we get somebody back for something different. Mm -hmm. Or they're re like I said, or they're returning. They want an increase. I mean, so it's not that we're seeing new veterans every week. Some of them are recurring, or we're still working in their process. And the need is there. They see that there there is an actual office that they can come to for even if it's just questions. Now, I've been helping people, I've been helping the younger generation veterans trying to look for work. I mean, we're kind of like a one-stop shop for them. They come in and we can help them with resources to get them back on the feet. Where they can, where they need to go for help or so on and so forth. And again, emergency relief, they're coming in for that. We've had quite a few. Luckily, I've been outsourcing it. Like I said, either Tom Shepard's taking it to the trust fund or I'm doing, um, when it comes to like propane, electric utilities, I outsource to True North, and they have been really good. At, I haven't had one denied yet. So, luckily, we're trying to save that cost that we put aside through our county fund. We're trying to not to spend it. We're spending it wisely. We're still spending it because it's there for the veterans, but we're making sure that we at least touch the avenues before we touch our county funds. So, it's been working out pretty well. Um, there is an opportunity to apply, like we got the 10000 but there is going to be another opportunity to uh, apply for that again. Um, but they have not released how it's going to work, who's going to be able to apply for that grant again. So I'll find out people. And again, I always reach out for, if I can get grant money or whatever I can reach out, I'll, I'll grab at it. You know, anything to save the county a little money. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, anything else? Thank you very much, Liz. You're welcome. We appreciate your report bringing us up today. Thank you. We can go ahead and wrap Would our prosecuting attorney like to step to the podium now? Emma? Okay, I'm sure everybody here knows me. I'm Kay.
Gassi. I'm the prosecuting attorney in Escota County. Um, the, the commissioners have asked all the department heads to give an update regarding what's been going on in our particular departments and our offices. So that's basically what I'm doing today, and I'm also making a couple of specific requests. I have provided three different documents to you. I will be referencing primarily the one titled Escota County BOC Department Head Update. This is going to be like my agenda in covering what I want you to know about what we're doing. I do want to make one correction. On the second page, I put 2012 events and accomplishments. I'm, I'm not referencing 2012, I'm referencing 2013. And then the next page, obviously my planned events and department objectives is for 2014. So I want to start with a review uh, basically, our, our increased caseload. In 2012, we had, and actually I'll reference, I know it's hard for everybody in the audience to kind of process these numbers, and next time I might actually try to use the projector, but for today, just bear with me. The memorandum that I prepared is specifically tailored to analyze and request a budget line for an assistant prosecuting attorney. When I talk and discuss the increased caseload, I want you to reference this document because that's where I go into detail. The reason I'm asking for an assistant prosecutor is primarily because we are in desperate need of further assistance in our office. The caseload, if you look at the first table that's provided in the memorandum, you'll see it states court 2012-2013 difference and percentage change. If you look, the annual total that we had in 2012 was 292 cases, and the annual total that we had in 2013 was 415. That's 123 more cases that were charged, prosecuted, and tried during 2013 as opposed to the previous year. And if you look, there's a substantial increase in circuit court felony cases. In 2012, there were 40 felony cases that were bound over from district court to circuit court, 40 throughout the year. In 2013, there were 90. That's 50 more, and it's a, that's a 125% increase in felony caseload. And Jack, you got to witness it yesterday in court when you said I was I did all the sitting and didn't have to do the work. <laughs> but when you have circuit court cases, and he was joking by the way. But when you have circuit court cases, you're dealing with serious felonies, and in comes four or five motions and briefs that need to be prepared four circuit court days, and if I have six or seven hearings, that means I can have 14 to 20 motions and briefs that I need to draft, respond to, and also research and brief prior to that court date. It doesn't leave a whole lot of time for sleep, recreational activity, eating, those types of things. Um, but it really, it takes away also from my commitment to my misdemeanor cases and my district court cases. You know, I still attend to those, which there's an increase in that area too. You know, there's what was it even? There's uh, 73 more cases in district court in 2013 than in 12. Uh, so there's more in district court as well, but really the primary focus and what's what's having a substantial impact in the office are the the additional felony bindovers, because those are the ones that are, uh, require so much time commitment. Now, to have an assistant would alleviate a lot of burden from me in regards to those misdemeanor cases. I intend to retain all responsibility and authority regarding all of my felony cases, any of the, the felony bindovers in circuit or in district court to circuit court. But in regards to the standard minor offenses of you know, operating a vehicle without security, operating without a license on your person, I mean, I'll spend hours prepping the paperwork to go over these minute um, infractions or misdemeanors in district court when I could be focusing my time on the more serious you know, criminal sexual conduct, homicide, um, all of our drug, our meth cases, our drug cases, there's there's a lot of more serious pending matters that I could be focusing my attention on instead of drafting civil infraction tickets in district court for no security and gathering up copies of insurance and so on and so forth. If I had an assistant to do that, it would alleviate a lot of that time and burden from me. Now, another area that has been an issue is conflicts. Now, everybody has a busy schedule, 
but I actually went through, and I hadn't done it until you wanted me to present this, so I'm glad you want, wanted this update, because I went through and counted how many conflicts, internal conflicts, there already were scheduled for me. And because I don't have an assistant, I'm the only individual in the county who can represent the county in court. Nobody else can. And so I can't have one of my assistants or, or clerical staff go and say, Judge, this is our position. They, can't, they cannot represent the county or the people in court. So it has to be me. And between January 1st of this year and January 28th, I have already had eight, and this is, this is last week, I had eight conflicting court dates where Judge Rutt wanted me upstairs, circuit court wanted me downstairs, or I had gun board and I had a jury trial scheduled, or I had, they, they automatically schedule these at the beginning of the year. So there were eight just from January 1st to 28th, and from January 29th to December 31st, there's 64 more coming up. And I, I juggled it last year, but I literally wore my tennis shoes some days because I was running back and forth, back and forth. And on you know, lunch break from jury trial, I shouldn't be up here doing child support hearings. It, that's not what you want me doing, and it's not what I should be doing. And to have an assistant would alleviate some of those conflicts for me as well. And these 64 conflicts, this isn't my vacation time. That's not when I want to go you know, to Jamaica. That would know, be more like 84 conflicting days. But this is strictly dates that the court has already set for me. So if I want to take a personal day, then, then I have nobody to cover for me. And again, that's why I requested an increase in my budget line for an assignment prosecutor. But like this week, I leave tomorrow to go to a prosecutor conference. I can't find a prosecutor to cover for me because guess where they all are? They're all at the conference. So it's still, if I don't have an assistant, then I still can't get another prosecutor that I know from another county to come in and cover for me because they're at the same trainings and conferences as I am. Now, I looked at some comparable counties, and I found this really interesting just to see the, the trend in crime in our county. And I don't know what, to, you know, I speculate as to what to... Um, really base that off of or why we were seeing this trend, but in looking at our population, about six and a half thousand, I, I showed you Montmorency, Alcona, Mackinac Lake, and Aranac, because they really are similar as far as how our offices are structured, uh, how the prosecutor office runs, etc. So that's why I chose these specific counties. And all of them have an assistant prosecutor, but if you look at the population of, for example, we're six and a half. Mount Morency is about nine and a half. Elkona's almost eleven thousand. Mackinac's over eleven thousand, etc. We had four hundred and fifteen total cases prosecuted in two thousand thirteen. I don't have their two thousand thirteen stats, but I do have their twelve stats. And in two thousand twelve, Mount Morency, with a thousand more people, they only had three hundred and eight total cases. We had four hundred and fifteen this last year, with fewer people. Alcona, in 2012, had 351. Again, substantially lower than what we prosecuted last year. And I would note that they have assistance, so their caseload, I just, I just for, for purposes of discussion and thinking about this, I, I cut that in half to say, okay, if they have an assistant, they're prosecuting about half that number of cases. So while I was prosecuting 415 cases last year, in Mount Morency, she prosecuted 154 because the assistant would have had about 50% of that burden. So it's, it's almost double, and in some cases almost triple, the amount of cases that are being prosecuted by one individual. It's a lot. And I would also reference the bottom line there, office budget. The total office budget that was apportioned in 2013 for our county was 152000 and a half. And at the end of the year, I had over $5,000 remaining in my budget. So we operated on a shoestring. We prosecuted that many more cases, and we spent less money. And if you look at all the other counties, the one that's closest in, uh, in financing is Alcona. They had 351 cases, and they operated their office on almost $200,000 a year. So we're over $50,000 cheaper to run to prosecute more cases. So we're doing pretty good. And the county's doing good financially. We're, we're operating really on a street street. We're doing a good job at it. So what I'm asking for is the, I understand you may not want to make the commitment of having an actual employee who's going to have benefits, who you know, is not um, 
easily not terminated, but if it's not working out, you know, it takes longer to fire somebody. I understand all the complications in hiring a new office staff, so I'm not recommending that we do that at this time. I'm asking for a contract to be approved for the subcontracting of an assistant prosecuting attorney to perform certain prosecutorial duties. I would ask that that be an $18,000 annual contract to be paid $1,500 per month. And I know $18,000 in addition to our budget might sound like a lot, but it's not. Uh, if you look at the other counties, it's not. And if you also look at what we're paying our defenders, our public defenders, I know you don't want to hear this because I, I balked about it at budget meeting, but our public defenders are getting $58,000 a year. At, at a total of $58,000 a year. So divided by three, they're getting a little over $19,000 each. In 2012, they were appointed to about 60% of all the cases. 60%. So they're getting paid more to take 40% fewer cases. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I can guarantee, if you look at the next page, I did another table for you to break it down. But if you look at how much we're paying our public defenders, if they took 60% of the cases, that means each one of them would have 83 cases a year. If I had an assistant prosecutor at $18,000 a year or $1,500 a month, if they took 60% of the cases, they'd have 249 cases. So you're talking, you're paying a public defender more to take 83 cases as opposed to an assistant to take 249. This is, again, one of the, I mean, I'm lowballing on this offer as far as $18,000. I'm hoping I can get somebody willing to come and do this. If you think about how much time that they would commit, if they worked 15 hours a week, it would be $25 for an hour. Yeah. And if they work 20 hours a week, it's $20 an hour. You know as well as I do that attorneys aren't cheap. That is dirt cheap. Even the public defenders used to get $60 an hour. And I'm wanting to pay somebody 20. So, at this point, because it's a trial period, I'm asking that it be only $18,000. So if we start this contract March 1st to the end of the year, you're looking at about $15,000 for the remaining portion of 2014. I don't know if I can find somebody that quick. I haven't been approved yet, but I did throw the word out there that I'm going to be seeking approval for this, and I've already gotten three applications. I'm not, I don't know if they're going to work out, but... I have already have three applications, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to get somebody who's who's going to make a good fit. <coughs> yeah. Should I wait for questions till the end? It's up to you, Andrew. Okay. What happened in the past with the conflicts when there was only one before you got here? You know, I wasn't here, but I've and asked my staff. That's not a fair question. I've asked Nina and Lisa. What, how, what did what did they do? Like, what did Barry do? What did Kathleen do? But. And I'm not, our office has been much more aggressive as far as prosecuting cases, so when they go to trial, they actually go to trial. They don't get dismissed last minute. And so the court got used to scheduling, double booking the prosecutor with the expectation that a case would be dismissed and they wouldn't actually be scheduled on those days. And that's that not brings, happening now. I guess that brings me to my next question, then. Why are the cases gone up? Or do we have this criminal element in the county that it's unaccounted for, or what? I've... When did you move in? <laughs> no, I, that's why I say I'd be speculating. I don't know if it's if it's a trend. We do have our sting officer that, that started the beginning of, when I started, the beginning of 2013. And some of our felony cases have definitely been, thanks to sting efforts and his efforts, but not 50 cases more. You know, there has been an increase, but I've, in looking at what happened in 2012, there were a lot of cases, felonies, that were pled out in, in district court. And so I think that has a bearing on the actual stats, but there were still more felonies that were authorized and approved in the first place. So I don't know that there's more crime, but there's more being authorized and more being prosecuted. Okay. And then I, I only have one other question, because, you know, I agree with you. Uh, are, are you going to see an increase in fines, in penal fines, or...? I don't know. I, there, we should, but I really don't know, because if they, like, let's say they serve six months in jail, or a year in jail, they don't pay during that period, they pay when they get out. So I would have to ask district court to analyze those stats to see 
from what convictions are we actually receiving money in restitution or court costs? Because I have no idea if somebody coming to pay is paying on a crime they committed this year or something they did three years ago. I don't, I don't handle that, but there have been more convictions. So we should see an increase in revenue. I don't know how long of a lapse in time that's going to take to actually recognize it, but there should be. Does so anybody have questions regarding specifically the request for the assistant prosecuting attorney? Because if not, then I'm going to move your attention to the sample contract that I did provide. It is a sample just for you to review, but it has the proposed terms for that contractual relationship if it's to be approved. And I understand that. Ms. Moore did provide a sample motion for approval of that budget line and contract. Yes, she did. If there's no questions, I'll move on. Okay. And going back to my department head update that I gave you. I know this is a little unexpected, and I didn't tell you this was coming, but I was thinking about it when I was preparing this update and running these stats, but I have two clerical staff, Nina and Lisa, they've both been here for a lot longer than I have, and they do a great job. I would ask that there be a consideration for a wage increase for both of those employees, because not only have I been prosecuting additional cases, but they've also been uh, enduring a substantially higher caseload and workload than they had before as well. And I can tell you that it gets frustrating, we all want to kill each other at times, but we, but they do good job, and they keep up, and we've been functioning well. And I think that their efforts deserve recognition as well. So, having that said, their request to me, I asked them to put down what they thought they should be getting and why. They did, I analyzed it, and I tweaked it slightly. There was a good point made that Lisa should be brought up to the same salary basis as Nina, or wage basis as Nina. I don't see why she shouldn't. They have the same caseload. They perform basically the same duties, the same amount of hours. They do the same amount of work. There's no reason, simply because Nina's been here a little bit longer, that she should continue to have that wage increase. And they both agree to that, and I do too. Not One of them does not do more work than the other. And in fact, Lisa's the one that's in charge of our criminal misdemeanor and circuit court filings. So she's she's taking most of the, the burden right now as far as increased workload. I'm not asking for additional funds to be apportioned because I know you're already being graceful and considering approving an assistant prosecutor budget line. But if you recall, the beginning of this year I asked for an increase in the assignment PA budget line so that I could have prosecutors fill in for me when I had conflicts. I'm asking that because we're starting this contract late, it's only going to be 15000 we have that 2000 already apportioned. I would like to ask that that $2,000 be apportioned to Nina and Lisa to increase their wage for the additional workload that they have been performing. It would be a 1.7% increase for Nina, so an additional $500 over the course of the year. And for Lisa, I'd like to bring her up to the same pay wage. That would be a 5.4% increase. So an additional $1,500 a year, that would put them in equal pay and it wouldn't cost the county a dime more out of their budget because it's already been apportioned to our department budget. I ask that you take serious consideration into this because I really do feel their efforts should be recognized as well. Is that just wages or is that the fringe too? That's just, that's just the wages. So we pick up the fringe. Pick up the fringe. That's come out of the uh, $2,000. Well, like I said, I'm not, yeah. I already tweaked it once they gave me their request because I figure I would be more convincing to you if it didn't cost any extra. That's why I limited it to $2,000 between the two and adjusted that percentage increase. Because I think that they would both be satisfied with it. It wouldn't be anything out of pocket other than fringe. That's not going to be that much more. You're talking a small percentage for retirement. And and it's going to recognize them for their additional efforts, which they deserve. And if I can mention just something, um, back um, a few years back when Barry um, was with us, he actually, when Lisa was hired, the board did approve Lisa to be 
on a step increase to eventually get to Nina's level. Um, probably, I would say, three years ago, four years ago, it fell at blue side. But that was the intent of Barry Shines back when he hired Lisa. And I, and I have that, that somewhere. I <laughs> do. <laughs> but that was his intent at that time when he hired him. And I think it's a good thing. I, I, like I said, I don't see any reason why one should have more, make more than the other simply because they've done their longer. If they don't do any more work, they share the burden equally, and they both do a good job at it. So I know it's not Would expected. you be upset if we didn't decide on this today? No, nope, that's chewed on it a little bit. not at all. I expected it because I know I just threw this at you, and like I said, it's because I had a revelation of what am I? I had, why am I not requesting this? And Wouldn't just did this last minute. <laughs> well, I can't. I didn't think of it earlier. It's kind of. I'm not asking for an increase myself because I want that assistant. <laughs> But Absolutely. I want them to have them because they're doing more work too. They deserve it. What I had in mind was taking that $2,000 and reducing the 15000 I know that's probably what you guys were considering. That's why I wanted to throw out another option. Because again, I'm asking for an $18,000 annual contract with fifteen for the remainder of this year. Our, our still situation is, is difficult also in that no one else got a raise. I understand that. And it, it's something we need to think about. And not only that, think about the ramifications that could be felt from doing something like this. Well, the way I see it, and it's just like I told them, put down on paper what you feel you're entitled to and why. And I believe that they've more than shown a substantial basis and established a basis for requesting a wage increase. It's not because, well, I haven't gotten one in two years. I don't agree with that. With you at all. But I'm just saying, when you do deliberate, please take into consideration the stats I have given you, because our office, in comparison to some, have seen a substantial increase in workload, and it should be recognized. We don't need to give everybody a pay increase across the board if there's not an additional workload or established basis for doing so in every department. But it is recognized here. And I